Hey, Jennifer, this is Steven. Hi, Steven, this is Jennifer. Hey, so how did we come to be acquainted? Uh, let's see. I know Inyash, and I've listened to a bunch of your podcasts. And I think Inyash said that you were looking for somebody to talk to about what lies dreaming, and I was totally excited to do that. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, you guys met at the Solstice, right? In California? Yeah, last year in San Francisco. Nice. Let's see. I'm trying to think. So uh, when you say podcast, do, did you listen to... I know you listened to the other one I did with Wes some weeks ago about What Lies Dreaming. Yes. But I've also listened to I don't know how many episodes of uh, the other one. Both of the ones. The one with Wes and the one with you and Ineage. Fun. Yeah, we did one on... Um, well, we did the Bayesian Conspiracy and then we do the... Uh, or we did, we've got, or what do we call it? Uh, not everything is a clue. The conspiracy. Where we read, gotcha. So I've listened to a bunch of those and uh, it's good stuff. Oh, fun. I appreciate it. Yeah, they're fun to do. Um, I mean, I guess we can just sort of dive right into it. Uh, this, I can't remember when I did the one. Oh, yeah. So I had this grand ambition back when Inyash was prepping for Burning Man. Okay. I was like, oh, I can, you know, he'll be, he'll be out of town for like 10, 12, 14 days. I can totally get three of these recorded and get the first one up. And... I forget what happened. I had some crazy busy week the entire first week I meant to get started and then had very little time to prep, had that one with uh, Wes and then kind of just set it on the back burner and suddenly it's been months. Uh, <laughs> so I was relieved when Inyash put us uh, in touch and we can uh, we can talk about these. But I, I mentioned all that because it's been a while since I've read this book. Um, and despite the uh, whatever a couple weeks you and I have been planning this out. I didn't actually write anything down uh, <laughs> until today. So trying to kind of refresh my memory, maybe we can kind of just work through it together. But yes, um, I've read it more recently, but my memory is also not terrific. So but I, I loved it. And I did take a few notes. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. Also with somebody else who knows Inyash, I think that's was part of what was super interesting to me about it was reading it and kind of knowing the author, but I don't even know him that well. So I don't know. The whole thing was interesting. Yeah, this is, I mean, so I've had the chance to talk with uh, author. We've done a couple other, um, well, I guess, yeah, I've done a couple other versions of podcasts like these, but they're usually longer. Like I did one with uh, Harry Potter and Methods of Rationality. Um, and I talked to Eliezer once or twice before, and then we got to talk with him after. And then Inyash, it took us almost two years to do Worth the Candle by uh, Alexander Wales. That one I haven't read. Uh, oh, it's it's fantastic. It's a web serial. I strongly recommend it. Okay. And if you don't find that it's long enough and you want to ex draw out the experience, you can listen to the episodes that we did. Uh, it was like two hours per three chapters. It, it, we made it, we dragged that thing out for a long time, but it was awesome. Yeah, uh, it sounds but, like there's a lot of meat in there, two hours per three chapters. Oh, the tons. Yeah, we had to cut ourselves back a lot. Um, <laughs> And then we got to talk with uh, Alexander Wales at the end of that. But the fun thing about this is that we get to psychoanalyze Inyash while we read this. So perfect. Uh, so I, I saw echoes of him throughout the entire book, which was a lot of fun. Yes, same, same, same. Uh, you want to get started talking about Andreas? Sure. Or do, actually, since we did Marcus uh, a while ago, do, do you have any like big stuff you want to hit there, or do you want to just kind of like I don't no, know I hit those beats well, as they come up? I think up? you guys covered it a lot. I think I think at the very end, maybe you were talking about like who who's the antagonist and who's the protagonist. And they're all three obviously think that they're doing the right thing. They all three get to live in the end, which I thought was interesting. And I just felt like it was so obvious that like Marcus Veris's uh, threshold for committing atrocities in the name of what he thought was right was so, uh, <laughs> so out of line with what uh, I thought either Inez or most of the people that we know would do. Whereas the other two guys, whatever they did, they were they were flawed, but they seemed much more justifiable. Whereas Marcus Verus, I was like, get out of here with, you know, starving a whole town. <laughs> yeah, um, that'll be fun to flag to talk with Enosh about because I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think Enosh should do that. Certainly not for that goal. I mean, well, actually, I don't know. Maybe, you know, he was being strictly utilitarian, right? He's like, sure, they'll all starve. You know, well, not all of them. A lot of them will starve and it'll hurt for a while, a generation or two. But then Rome will be strong, you know, stronger than ever, yada, yada. Maybe Inyash is the uh, the mustache twirling utilitarian in this scenario, and he would do the same thing. <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to ask him. Yeah, um, but yeah, certainly uh, Andreas. Um, I don't know. I, I think I mentioned this in the in the last one. I'll probably repeat myself a bit just because I don't really remember what I talked about. Uh, that must have been when was Burning Man? August. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, so it's been at least of, two months. Yeah, early September. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know, six, eight weeks. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, my, my thing with Andreas was like kind of the second we get his vibe, like what's going on with him. I All I could think of is that it's like he got infected with the voice of Peter Singer. <laughs> yeah. Never and enough. You've never, it, you will never do enough. Yeah. I remember I read, um, what was his essay? Uh, Famine, Affluence, and Morality um, that he published in 1975. I read that when I was like 20 and I was like immediately sold. And I, I you know, even he doesn't, you know, give everything he could because that's the, the point is, is like, you know, it's it sort of to maybe, I don't know, I, I don't like the compulsory language with um, morality. People say demanded or whatever, obligatory, but it, it's implied anyway that like you give everything that's not of comparable moral worth until you're sacrificing that much to help people, right? And Andreas's whole thing is, you know, he, he, I remember like what, I, that, that's the thing with like all the monsters, you know, they give everybody the, one of the sins they're kind of like corrupted with it and during the the what do you call hunger but the sin famine. version uh gluttony oh well, yeah, yeah 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 famine yeah but like so everyone's starving so he gets that bread and then he gives some to that little girl and then other people take it and he's pissed and he goes and like gives the rest to her and you know tries to like make them all feel bad but it's like he and i think he, you know there's parts in the story where you know he finally earns some money and he's like trying to pay off these these huge debts that I'm sure he he accrued by giving away all of his family's money. And then it's like, oh shit, I best I better give it to this homeless guy. And you know what? Why not my military ring too? You know, like everything he can. Yep. And it's it's uh it's very short term. I think Peter Singer's approach would be a little more uh, well actually is a bit more long term. Like yeah, there's no sure. sense in giving everything you have like if I sold my computer and my, you know, house to donate money, then I couldn't have a job anymore and would cease to be able to earn money to give right you'd like to convert it all into tents to give to homeless people and now you have no, nothing else and right you, and the, you haven't solved it still so yeah andreas as gods seem less uh long um i don't know longer planning what, what's the word i'm looking for long-termy long-term thinkers yeah. yeah they're not as much long-term thinkers um, it was, it was super interesting to me to be the, the, uh, so him in the second person was like really well done because it's just so off putting and you don't usually read it. And so you're sort of really in his head and understanding that like, it's not stable in there. Um, and it feels weird yeah. in there. And, you know, it could, I, at first I was sort of just like interpreting it as he's just hearing voices. Like he's just got, he's got mental problems and he's hearing voices, but the voices would actually give him real information, real intel enough to like save him like there's someone around the corner or uh i don't know he would he would get these whispers and sometimes i was like oh that's not actually like some of that is maybe real and magic is real in this universe so i don't know who these gods are it was just all of it was very unsettling and i think uh effective effectively written in the second person awesome yeah i i put the same thing about like in one way it could just be like a guilty conscience uh, like half of his uh, half of the god speak in his head, but yeah, you're right. Like during fights, they be like duck or behind you or whatever. And unless they're picking up on some cue that he subconsciously heard or something, I'm inclined to think that, that they're real, right? The other gods are real, the ones that are ripping the universe apart. So right, <laughs> why not? Why not these ones? Um, but yeah, it it's uh, it was an interesting um, experience for me too because I, I I remember I don't know years and years ago being curious about like why there's first person and third person in books. And then I finally Googled like, what is second person? Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, I've never read anything like that. I wonder if anyone does that. And I wonder, I don't have any insight. We'll have to ask you this too, but why he chose to do three perspectives for these characters. Like, I think, I think each one actually works really well for all of them. Yeah. But how definitely. he like did, was it just an exercise to see if he could do it? You know, how did he pick Andreas to do second person, et cetera. Yeah. But, let's ask him. Yeah. But like you said, what it does for, the reader, at least, you know, for, for you and me was like, it, it made it clear, it, like when his mind wanders, you know, it, it's just like a stream of consciousness, right? Yeah. When and he's it, there, it's you like, need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this. There, there wouldn't be another way to write it and feel like you were up in there with him. Yeah. And he has like some flashbacks and stuff that like there aren't line breaks for to, you know, trigger the end and beginning of just because like, that's not how it works when we're, when our minds wander either, you know? Right. Oh yeah. I didn't notice that. That's good. I remember at least at one point early on in the book being confused about like when the flashback started and ended. 
like did he teleport home or something but i probably just misread it my reading comprehension isn't uh what i'd like it to be for someone who's talked about books for good god like 200 hours on podcasts but um but yeah uh i don't know i'm I'm trying to think of like where to hit with with andreas here um i'll let you drive for a bit i kind of just ramble if i'm not stopped oh no oh no we could be in trouble i can ramble too but i i think he was just so much struggle i think that um the other guys for better or for worse seem to have a little more clarity of purpose And because he was so trapped with, you have to do all the good and fix all the problems. um, And I don't think they were always very clearly prioritized. Then he didn't, you know, he's got to, he's got to murder someone because he's got to get enough pay to help his mom get out of debt because he kind of caused that problem. But then once he gets paid, he needs to use that pay to solve hunger for a few people, but that's not enough either. And so he just had, he just, I, I felt like he, they were all struggling, but he was struggling to even figure out what to do. Like, what was his goal? I don't know. Um, but he, but he, but whatever it was, he wanted to help. Yeah, that's a good point. I, as far as like what his goals were, and you know, because they're so often like aligned with whatever the gods are yelling in his head, and they don't seem to have like, other than like I remember they're burning or they're they're collecting all the grain from the storehouses or something for the the mob he's got. And they're like, you have to leave some for everyone else. Uh, that seems like to be like the longest term planning I remember them the gods doing, which is like at least a day later. Um, mm-hmm. But they like, it seems like whatever the most important thing is is what's happening right then, not like a long term plan. Yes, um, you know, like keeping his family out of like losing their home. You know, is that more important than making sure that homeless guy has plenty of money? It's hard. It's hard to say, but it's like the emergency in front of you suddenly occupies all of your attention. Yes. And perhaps if you spend all your time fighting fires, you're not as effective as you could be. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I remembered like really looking forward to figuring out when like all the, the God stuff, the God chattering his head started. Cause it was clear that this wasn't a thing he had always dealt with. Um, and we finally get it at some point, like halfway through the book. And it was that awesome thing when uh, he, he and his, uh, I forget what you call it, his military band, um, mm-hmm. were going through, was it Jerusalem or just some whatever random No, I think it was town. Jerusalem. Yeah, and they see that like, oh, look, an enemy. And like, it's clearly not, he thinks it's not and he doesn't want to help, but it, it it's like, uh, oh, it. I think it was like explicitly a kid. Um, and and all of his uh, his squad members throw their javelins and he's kind of feeling the peer pressure. So he's like, uh, all right. And I think he goes to miss, but it's just like a dead shot. Yes. And he's the only one who hits him. Oh. And I loved the line. Cause this is when it started in his head. It said, you can never atone for this. You will atone for this. Oh, exactly. Exactly. And yeah. The, the driven by an unrepayable guilt, uh, really kind of summarizes his struggle that's um, really true. And the guilt just keeps getting worse because he keeps like not being able to solve it for people. And so then now, you know, he 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 uh, hires himself out to commit atrocities, which then piles the guilt on more. But he, the reason he's doing that is to try to atone in some other way. Like he, the poor guy is just doomed. Like there's no way he's going to win this fight because there's no yeah. way to get it. <laughs> That's a good point. I mean, like, you know, it's, again, I can't help but think of uh, the, you know, peter singer long slide down to homelessness and the utilitarian argument like you know you can give 10 percent of your income and you should you should feel great about that right Mm -hmm. but it's like man i just bought a starbucks that starbucks amounts to Mm -hmm. i I think actually inyash wrote a short story that is available somewhere oh you're Um, right i think i have read something about i see i see something children i I see see dead kids i I see dead kids maybe yeah i'll uh i'll find it and link to it in the show notes but uh the the author in that is like thinking of it in, or rather the protagonist is thinking of things in terms of like, whatever, fractions of lives saved, maybe in fractions of dead kids. Right. And uh, the, Andreas is what you get if you try to live like that. Yeah. Right. And and his drowning it out with alcohol, I think is uh, poignant and like super appropriate. Super understandable. If I had to walk around with that in my head. I mean, there have been times in life when I almost feel like I have a, you know, a, a, a one one thousandth version of that in my head where you just like, 
there's too much and one problem solves causes another problem and you can't solve it. And I, I can't imagine feeling like the actual literal gods are yelling at you for every mistake you make. <laughs> I would drink too. Right. And, and the fact that it works, I think is interesting too. Um, I, I know it's, it's suggestive of something, but I'm not feeling very good at putting together metaphors right now. Like it, I mean, I don't know. I've always thought of using drugs and alcohol. It's, it's like borrowing happiness from the future. Um, mm -hmm. Ooh, that's good. And, and the way that, that uh, Andreas uses it is it's like just putting off the problems. Right. And, yeah. and once he's, once he's sufficiently drunk, he's dissociated enough to where he's no longer doing stuff, you know? And then he pays for uh, it hard the next day when, when exactly when they're back yelling at him even harder. What was, um, I'm trying to remember, gosh, now I feel bad for not being able to remember this distinction. Was the, there was like that Jewish slave girl. Oh, that was different. Edith? That was different person than the, um, uh, the apprentice witch, right? Uh, no, I think those were the same girl. Like the one that he kind of met that first night when he brought back his money and he went to go meet, I think, uh, Cornelius. She was there and then he ended up uh, using her as a translator for the barbarian wizard guy and she turned into the apprentice witch. I think that's, I think we're talking about the same person. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I liked, I, I just, I remember their whole dynamic of like she immediately hated him and mm -hmm. he couldn't quite figure out why. And... I forget the moment like where she puts it succinctly and it finally clicks for him. I maybe that jogged your memory. Um, he, uh, I don't know if this is the same thing, but the you know he showed up with a bunch of money and then he he like traded you know way too much grain for a few glasses of wine and left it all with them because they clearly needed it. And then she immediately figured out that uh, he got paid in grain to do a task, and he said it was I was breaking up smuggling rings for the emperor or something. And she said, well, it's a famine, so nobody was trying to smuggle grain out of the city because they could have sold it for a zillion dollars. So they must have mm. been trying to get grain into the city. And if you were if you were shutting people down from getting grain into the city, then fuck you. That's right. Yeah, God, that was awesome. Um, and, you know, well deduced on her part. <laughs> well uh, deduced on her part. I mean, it, it, it was, you know, it was kind of the truth. You know, it was what he was told. Th those were his, you know, marching orders, right? But... Yeah. Uh, he knew he was doing the wrong thing when he was doing it. And of course, no one was going to cut him any slack for his uh, just following orders. Right. Um, so let's see. I'm trying to remember other like major points to hit with him. But you yeah. know, like, like he, he allies with the uh, the people in the slums. I forget what that neighborhood is called. Mm -hmm. I forget too, yeah. but I know what you're talking about. Um, and that was really like, I felt like he actually had some peace there. He felt like he was had found the right side, was doing the right thing was just like for a moment he had like, you know, he was rallying them because that was another thing. He was like, I want to get these people to fight for themselves. Like they're just sitting here and there are way more of them than there are these rich jerks. So if I could get them to rise up and fight for themselves, but but they wouldn't. And then he finally got some of them too. And I, I just felt like for a for a brief shining moment he could see, he was like, Yeah, this is gonna work. We're gonna do it. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take it take it all back for the people. Um Yeah. And he was feeling pretty good and then it didn't work. <laughs> it it worked i guess as well as it could have but i remember the you're right it didn't work at first there was like that feast with like the roast pig or something yes and then those two roman soldiers come out and they're like oh great taxes or something and they go to heft the whole thing oh. and i think he might have a sword or a knife but he was like we can you know we'll stop you and he's like what's this we bullshit and he's like well there's tons of us and no one else will stand up to fight with him yeah and no. that that actually feels very Idiosh. Uh, you know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, or maybe I'm ascribing too much to him, and he'll he'll object. But the the frustration of the lack of coordination there, mm -hmm. <laughs> like I, I remember uh, Sam Harris put it. As, he's the uh, I, I'm, you've probably heard oh, of Sam yes. Harris. Yes, yes. Um, he he had that way of uh, articulating so well, like how society now is better coordinated to handle or better situated to handle some coordination problems, like. Uh, the, the example he gave was like the, if, if someone, if someone with a box cutter stood up and tried to take control of a plane, it would never work like it did 20 plus years ago. Right. He's like, no, nah, people would get up that second and beat the shit out of the guy. Yep, right. Exactly. They wouldn't just stand there and worry about getting cut. Like, so, you know, Andreas being that the season, the battle hardened seasoned soldier is like, no, nah, let's do this. Yeah. Some of us might get hurt, but we can easily win this. And everyone else is, eh, I don't know, plus, you know, the retaliation. And 
to to their to the to the mob's point, the retaliation would have been intense. But it's it's that sort of again short sightedness that he's got just drilled into his brain that you know, hey, we can solve this problem right now, the one right in front of us. Right. Uh, and if it makes a bigger problem for tomorrow, well, that's tomorrow's problem. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. When you come to burn down your whole village with your families in it, we'll solve that tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Edis, you said her name was. That's right. Yes. Um, or Edis. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but. I'll um, take it that way. One thing about Andreas I did not think that I fully understood at all was the ending. I'm very curious to ask some more questions about that. Or he, he, he got on the crazy monster, flying monster and flew away. Yeah, especially given, I mean, Inuyasha is a fan of like grim dark stuff, mm-hmm. and you know, and again, it's kind of fun just being able to psychoanalyze, knowing that he'll listen to this. <laughs> uh, I I anticipated a way sadder ending. I was I I don't know him as well, but when I was reading this, I I what I do know of him, yeah, I wasn't so sure um, if I thought the ending was uh, satisfyingly optimistic, actually. I can't remember if I left a comment on one of the posts because I read it on the website. I have the paperback too, but I wanted to read it on my phone. And I can't remember if I left a comment or if I just thought it, but somewhere along the way, I was like, you know, what? I'm getting less and less hopeful that this story is going to have a happy ending. Oh, no. and, <laughs> and it it really did. Like you said, I'm, I'm also surprised that the three protagonists survived. But yeah, as far as him just flying off on that, because he also had um, Edith's corpse. Yeah. And like, I guess... I mean, I think it said something about the gods are quiet in his head. Um, maybe that's just what he, you know, when when he was done and he was kind of free of their burden on him, uh, he was just ready to get a fresh start somewhere. He was just done. What did he say? He's done, done with this world. He, you know, he was done with the world of men. Maybe even I maybe maybe that isn't right. But I thought that was interesting because he basically peaced out. And then <laughs> not to jump to Joa, but Joa's thing was like, I, I can't abandon this world because there are still people here that I care about. So I have, I have to stay here and like work with this and try to make it better because my family's here. And Marcus had no, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Andreas had no, nobody left to give a damn about. So he bailed. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was, I mean, it's certainly true that he didn't really form any lasting friendships, you know, like. I think, uh, again, jumping to Joa a bit, like Joa's, I, I, like he had like his found family. I think he goes looking for the other two slaves that he's friends with. It's not like he goes looking for his brother and parents or something, right? No, no, no. It's his, it is the, yeah, Zia and the, yeah, the two, the two fellow slaves that he was kind of in charge of and protective of. Eric. Yeah. Eric. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, and so, yeah, so he goes off looking for them and like, that's just really sweet. <laughs> that we have chosen family and we have people in the world that we show up for and uh and we stick around for them and i was like oh <laughs> at the end i really I, I didn't see that coming that was i thought it was i thought it was really nice and really optimistic yeah well i i feel like i could find some way to drag this out but we can we can move on to more focusing on joe if you'd like sure yeah let's do it